In comments on my last video, which came out a couple of days ago on steampunk Marxism, I had several objections raised to something I'd said way back in December about unequal exchange. Uh, that the talk I gave then was a polemic against the idea that GDP per capita differences between countries like the USA or Germany on the one hand and India on the other hand are to be explained by unequal exchange. This is an old pre-Marxist Proudhonian socialist idea. And I gave two examples of industries to disprove it, the agricultural and steel sectors in industry in India and the US. Uh, I, I had this slide here, which shows for grain production a huge difference, a 70 to 1 difference roughly, between the output per worker in India and the output per worker in the USA. And for steel production, just under a, a sevenfold difference in productivity per worker. Now, the ratio of GDP per capita between the USA and India is midway between these logarithmically, uh, 30 times higher in the, the US, 30 times higher GDP in the US. Um, the, it's true that the GDP per capita is substantially greater than the difference in productivity in the steel industry, which was one of the criticisms I, I faced but it's much lower than the difference in agricultural productivity. And agriculture is a much bigger share of the Indian economy than it is of the US economy. So it tends to drag down the overall productivity in India. That is the single most important factor of Indian underdevelopment. The fact that it's still disproportionately an agricultural economy of poor peasant agriculture and this is low productivity in agriculture and the low productivity in agriculture means that the reserve army of labor that's available in India has its conditions of life set by what the reserve army would earn as peasants. Uh, this is what Marx calls the latent reserve army. And because the productivity of labor is so low there, this means that it sets a low floor on the level of wages in India. Now, my data is, was deliberately based on physical productivity in, as tons per worker year. The reason for that is to exclude arguments about unequal exchange. Because if you take tons per worker year, a physical unit, the differences in value productivity must necessarily closely follow these differences in physical productivity. Both grain and steel have well-developed and competitive world markets. If a US or an Indian exporter is selling grain or steel to at some third country like Nigeria or Indonesia, they'll both get roughly the same price. If US steel is sold in Nigeria and Indian steel is sold in Nigeria, they can't deviate substantially in terms of price. And there will be no unequal exchange for them in the world market, barring such effects as um, NAFTA, meaning that the Indian um, steel would mean, meet a slightly higher tariff going into Mexico than US steel. But the, these tariffs under WTO terms are fairly marginal anyway, and certainly nothing like the order of magnitude that is required to explain um, the differences in GDP per capita in India and the USA. What I'm saying is that Indian value productivity is lower than that in the USA, primarily because sector for sector, where the same products are produced, India requires more labour. And not only does it require more labour, it requires a lot more labour. And therefore, when compared to the world average socially necessary labour time, the Indian labour hour 
constitutes as less than a world average labor hour. Let, let's take um, other countries, for example. US steel pr productivity was particularly high, 886 tons per worker. Now, the world average in 2019 was 300 tons per worker. So that's the world socially necessary labor time. The Indian requirement of, of uh, sorry, the necessary labor time is one three hundredth of a working year per ton. The Indian requirement was one hundred fiftieth of a working year per ton, roughly. So Indian labor in the steel sector counts as half of socially necessary labor. US labor in the steel sector counts as roughly three times socially necessary labor because it's three times as productive and therefore it adds one hour of um, US steel workers labor adds the equivalent of three hours of average world steel workers labor. U US is high even compared to other capitalist countries. For instance, in in Germany, it's uh, they only produce 461 tons per work. Now, a reader who doesn't give his real name says, of course, American steel worker is more productive because two thirds of his raw materials are not ore and coke, but recycled scrap. Whilst in India, only a quarter of steel is made from scrap. Of course, it's easy to be more productive when half of your value added was already added by your dad 30 years ago. How can I put it in more simple terms, he says, or she says. There are two confusions here. Firstly, I was not giving value per year statistics, but tons per year statistics. So value added it doesn't enter into the argument, except in so far as when steel is sold on the world market, there's a world market value for steel. And I'll next show that it makes almost no difference to steel production in the USA, whether it's produced by an electric arc furnace and therefore uses scrap steel, or whether it's used, produced by a blast furnace whose ultimate inputs are coke and iron ore, or coal and iron ore. So let's look at the two methods of production in the USA. If steel is being produced by a blast furnace, well, it obviously starts with a blast furnace and goes to a basic oxygen process, but let's just consider up to the point of providing the steel, the, the iron. You need 0.77 of a tonne of coal and 1.6 tonnes of iron ore. Current market prices of those, as of the day I made the film, made the video, 108 dollars per tonne coal, $112 per tonne iron ore, total cost $262 per tonne on raw materials. Let's look at the electric arc furnace. It requires one tonne of scrap steel to be melted down. Scrap steel is currently selling at $254 per tonne. In addition, you require electricity. You require 400, around 400 kilowatt hours. The price that American industry can get out to is about 0.7, about 7 cents a kilowatt hour. So we get a total um, cost of raw materials is actually higher for the scrap steel. So the scrap steel doesn't actually count as um, a particularly cheap or productive way of doing it. And in fact, it's probable that the, the value of scrap steel on the um, market in the USA is set by the cost and labor requirements to produce steel directly from um, coke and iron ore. Um, the difference being that the value of this scrap has already been paid for when it was originally sold 10 years ago, 15 years ago in a car. The, it's not therefore passing over any extra value to the final product. It has an imputed value 
which is set by the amount of coal or iron ore that would otherwise be needed if you didn't use it. Um, the, there is an, a bit of extra cost to the blast furnace because you need some oxygen as well. But I mean, that, that's relatively small. Now, suppose we follow our critic a bit further, which he says, I didn't include the raw materials used. Well, the, the scrap and coal is part of the raw materials. But suppose I just looked at the part of it that was produced using coal. Would the fact figures be more favourable to the Indian economy if we looked at the productivity in the coal industry? No, it wouldn't, because the productivity in terms of tonnes per worker in the Indian coal industry is even worse in comparison to the um, American coal industry. The tonnes per worker year is 1,600 in the Indian coal industry, 14,000 in the US coal industry. The US coal industry is much more highly mechanised and the productivity ratio there is 8.8. .8. The productivity ratio in, the, the, in final steel production was 6.9. So were I to have included the labour required to produce the coal, the figures would look even less favourable to the Indian industry. Well, let's look what he says. Why the use of recycled scrap increases productivity? Because the worker's job is not only to create new value, but transfer old value. It is how much of the old value is transferred for each unit of produce that determines how much of the newly created values get embodied in each unit. Well, that's rather confused. But as I've shown, the amount of value transferred from the raw materials is the same to within 10%, whichever way it's done. And he then says the purported seven to ten times difference is not enough to account for the GDP per capita differentials, which are 30 times higher in the USA. Where does the exist extra 2000% of product come from? Well, it comes from the fact that in 2014, some 45% of Indians were still working in agriculture where the physical productivity gap to the US was a whopping 69 to 1. Why bother with this nonsense? It's because the theory of unequal exchange as an explanation for differences in GDP is empirically wrong, first point. Second point, it's a regression to pre-Marx Proudhonian ideas that uh, profit arose through cheating in exchange. And it leads to serious political deviations. In the developed capitalist countries, it leads to the wrong idea that the working class are not exploited, but are beneficiaries from exploitation. This is complete nonsense, and you will never be able to build a socialist movement in the USA if you propagate that kind of nonsense. In less developed countries, like India, it leads to bourgeois nationalist deviations, like claiming that the main enemy in India is imperialism, uh, which is somehow cheating India in, in world markets rather than the national capitalist class. And it offers no practical escape for the mass of the people in underdeveloped countries. It's only through undergoing a rapid planned socialist industrialization aimed at raising the productivity of labor that you can improve living conditions. That's the strategy which socialist governments follow. Industrialise as fast as possible, raise the labour productivity as fast as possible.